Welcome to another edition of Jack in the Booth. I'm Jack McShane. Now our guest this week is Ryan Rucco. Ryan calls Nets and Yankees games for Yes Network in New York. Now he also handles play-by-play -play for both the NBA and the WNBA and ESPN. Now if that's not enough, he's the co-host of a popular podcast with former Major League pitcher CeCe Sabathia. And coming up, you'll hear the story behind how that podcast started and how the importance of saying yes to everything helped him move up in the broadcasting ranks. But first, we touched on his plans for calling games during the coronavirus pandemic. So if you had any decisions to make regarding whether or not you're going to be doing MLB or NBA games, because I know you do a little bit of both. So uh, what are your plans for the coming weeks and months? Yeah. So um, what's interesting is like, you know, sometimes we like you're waiting to get your schedule and you're like, um, you're like, oh, you know, you know, someone knows and they just haven't distributed it yet. So you might right. like text the person and be like, hey, you know, I'm kind of trying to figure things out. You know, any chance you can let me in, whatever. And like, you know, they may be able to tell you, they may not, but they know. In this case, people don't know, you know, like it, it's just like everything is you decide last minute because, you know, it's not just um, a matter of like plugging in your, you know, uh, different production people into a production schedule. It's also like a very complicated uh, navigation right now with the networks, mm. finding the windows for games because you know, your whole routine and the normal slotting that you would have with scheduling is completely different now, you know? Um, and it'll be even more different uh, depending on what happens with college football or not, you know? Um, because if, if there's no college football, all of a sudden the windows at ESPN are completely different when we could put WNBA or NBA and, or MLB on the air, right? Uh, so, uh, and same thing with, you know, NFL. So with that in mind, um, it's, uh, it's interesting right now, just like uh, figuring all of that out. I know I'm going to have a ton of WNBA coming up uh, beginning this week. Um, I am going to have a lot of the remaining Nets regular season games. I will be contributing to Yankees telecast uh, at different moments in different fashions. Exactly how is still, I think, being determined. And then my MBA on ESPN contributions, I will not be down in Orlando for uh, the start of the regular season, but I may be there for the playoffs. And so that is still being determined based on them figuring everything else out with the network schedule. So it's all kind of up in the air. Now, do you prefer to be in studio or um, in studio, meaning like, at the field or in the field or like, is there any benefit to doing a game from home or is it all better to do it like in person at the field, even though there's no fans in this? Yeah, game? I think, I think it's always better, you know, to be on site um, because, you know, you're just going to be able to react to the action and see mm. uh, best. Right. I mean, you're, you're, when you're limited to a monitor, you're always going to give something up that you would have been seeing if you had the full scope of the court and the arena. Um, having said that, I don't think it's, I don't think it's something that can keep you from doing a good job, you know, and I don't think it's, it's going to be quite the same experience being on site as it would have been um, because you're not going to have fans, like you said, to get that energy from, and you're also going to be further up. You're no longer going to be on the floor uh, for distancing purposes. I think also the awkwardness of like, you know, you're calling a game and the players on the floor can hear everything you're saying because there's no crowd. You know what I mean? Like now there's going to be some pumped in noise. So maybe that'll mitigate some of that, but it could be a little weird to like be right on the floor being like, Oh, poor shot by James. And then, right. like, LeBron looks at you. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Like, I, I think it's going to be a little different even if you were on site. But it's also, you know, there's so many considerations that go into it. Like for WNBA, you know, there was a thought to have us on site in Bradenton for all of the games. But you're talking about, you know, so for me, the difficulty of that for what would have ended up being like basically a three-month period of time right. is, um, you know, also then how do I do any of my yes responsibilities, right? Um something we could have worked around, but something to, you know, be aware of, uh, in the case of, um, 
Rebecca Lobo, she has four kids. You know, you're going to tell her to go be in Bradenton for that long a period of time, you know? And then it was like, well, maybe we could go back and forth and call the games on site, but come back to New York, kind of like normal games. But then obviously you're seriously increasing your exposure flying that much, right? Right. And, and you are also, or, uh, and now you also have to quarantine for, you know, 14 days in, in New York and Connecticut where Rebecca and I live. Uh, if you're coming back from Florida. So I think like we feel, especially with the sport of basketball, we can do a really good job off of monitors and ESPN is setting it up beautifully for us. Um, and look, a lot of broadcasts do get done that way now for budgetary reasons, you know, where you're calling from a studio except for X games, you know, or like, you know, in, in, in the MLS model with the regional sports networks, it's road games, you're in the studio, home games you're on site you know um and so it and it works like you could do a, a great broadcast that way i think you're always going to be better off on site and i do think there's a chance we end up on site for playoffs with WNBA, and um and i think there's a chance i end up on site for playoffs for nba but uh but i do think you know it can be done from monitors in the studio i know you mentioned that espn's done you know a good job in terms of like setting you guys up to be able to call these games as like an overall thought, do you think that these leagues have done a good job in terms of ensuring player safety and making sure that we get these games in? You know, as good a job as you can do. Right. You know? I mean, I think like, you know, when people talk about like, you know, staying shut or reopening or whatever, like it's not a sustainable thing to say, hey, we're going to sit and do nothing until there's a vaccine. Right. Like, right. You know, uh, I'm optimistic about when that will be. Let's say it's the fall, which, you know, I'm optimistic about. But still, you're telling people to basically, like, do nothing for tw 10 months or something. You know what I mean? That's, like, really hard. So instead, it's okay. Like, risk-reward, right? Like, right. we're not going to just do things the way we were doing them because that's too risky. But what can we set up uh, so that we can still be the viable economic entity that we are and we also can be considerate of the very tangible health risks that are out there right now uh, because of COVID-19. And I think the NBA came up with a wonderful system. I think it was practical for what they had remaining with their schedule. Um, and I think that, you know, if I was going to say the place that I would feel most secure at health and safety wise, it'd be Disney World, honestly. Like, I just think Disney is always front and center when it comes to technological innovation with those kind of things. Um, and so I, I have full confidence in them being able to do it. Good partnership with the NBA. And I do think they're giving themselves the best chance uh, technically, um, you know, to have everything they need at their disposal and be able to get through the season. Still some risks, you know, right. I mean, if, if a player on a team gets COVID, you know, there's still a chance other players are going to get it because of the close interactions. But I think they're doing as much as they can to make it safe, having medical personnel available, um, keeping restrictions uh, within the site, and still having, like, really high-level, high-quality um, amenities and services for the players. Uh, I think in the case of MLB and NFL, you're not going to be able to do that bubble. You know, you're, 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 you're not going to be able to pull that off. Um, I think uh, I, I just don't think tangibly uh, it was going to be something as easy to pull off for those sports for different reasons. Um, I mean, and for the NFL, the entire season, you're not going to you're not going to go put, you know, all these people in a bubble from September to February, you know, or well, it's just more players, right? Yeah. It, well, there's way more players. Right. And there's also there's way more time that has to be allotted. Right. Right. Like you're talking about, let's say let's say you're putting them in the camp in late July. You're going to have them late July to January. You know what I mean? That's like, that's not, that's just not realistic. We can mm. talk about it all we want. You can't tell people, Hey, sorry, you have to go isolate from your families in one location for that. Yeah, like no one's doing that. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're opting out of that season, then, right? Like they're not going to do that. It's easier. Like I, I even think about it from my perspective, broadcast wise, if you told me, Hey, you got to go down in Orlando and can't be with your family for two months. Like, I am not thrilled about that, but I can do it. You know what I mean? Right. If you tell me six months, I'm like, that's kind of like a non-starter. You know what I mean? Like, we yes. need to find a better way. So, 
I, I think there's risks. I think the sport themselves, like themselves obviously have inherent risks. Um, but I think the leagues are doing as good a job as they can uh, with their protocols, you know, and, and just testing as often as they do at least allows things to be bottled up when there is um, a positive case. Now, a lot of players like LeBron James or like an Aaron Judge type have different game day rituals that they have. Uh, do you have any specific ones on game day that this is what I do, like before a Nets game or before a, a Yankee game that you, in terms of preparation? Yeah, man, there's so many things I do uh, mm -hmm. prep wise to be ready for a broadcast. You know, it's just hours and hours and hours of prep uh, over multiple days. But on a day of game, I like to um, get up. Uh, the, the first thing I like to do is work out just to like get my mind going. Then um, I like to give myself time so I can work out and then have a couple hours of prep, uh, kind of like going over. Usually there's nothing that like, I I'm usually done with everything that like has to be done for me to go on air. And now it's like kind of diving into some of the other things that like kind of take you to the next level in your preparation. Um, and I like to do a lot of that before we'll have, let's say for the national broadcast, I do a production meeting around lunchtime. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to like have all that done before the production meeting so that I can go in the production meeting with all those other thoughts. Then when I get back, I will uh, spend the next few hours in my hotel room. I basically on a game day, I won't really leave my hotel room uh, or the hotel other than to work out in a production meeting or if we go to shoot around or something, but I'm not like going for a walk or like doing anything social on a game day. You know, I'm resting my voice, I'm drinking hot water. I'm drinking throat coat tea um, and I'm going over my game boards and more stories. And, and sometimes what I'll do is if I have all my prep done is I'll, I'll end up Googling each player uh, at the end of everything else I've done just to make sure there's nothing like hot and relevant that I'm missing in all of my research and the research that ESPN and Yes Network provide us. Um, and then uh, and then I will um, every once in a while, I'll take a little nap then and then shower get ready to go um but that's kind of my game day routine i am curious though man like so much of that's going to be changed for this period of time you know? right I, doris and i sometimes we'll go for in uh, from a production meeting we'll go right to whole foods and grab like something healthy that we can have for like dinner before we go to the arena you know and because i don't like to eat at the arena usually because i like to just be locked in Right. But it's like all that stuff's changing, you know, so it's uh, it's weird, man. It's definitely going to be going to be a different uh, different style of doing things. Now, do you find it more challenging to do like an NBA or an MLB game, considering like the games are, you know, every other day or even every day? I mean, because to compare to like an NFL game where it's like it's only once a week. So or is it easier because you're have you used the prep that you had from the night before? So I think vocally it is easier doing NFL you know mm. if, if you're just like locked in on football and once a week you're kind of busting out your pipes like you could do that you know um, baseball and basketball are a little harder vocally you know there are times where with basketball I might have five games in seven days and like you know because of the normal we're talking normal scenario obviously right. like arena noise the intensity of the sport like the the power of the action like you know it takes a lot out of you vocally um and baseball is can be challenging vocally when you're going a ton of days in a row you know it's a little bit easier at times because um there aren't as many kind of like high drama punctuation moments you know right. as there are in basketball but um prep wise it's interesting like so I think football is the hardest to prep for. It's so laborious and there's just so many players um, and knowing each of their stories and, and having meetings with so many different people in regard to the other, every team, you know, that it becomes a really, I mean, it becomes a really intense uh, uh, sport to prep for. Um, with basketball, it's, it, it's, um, it's a hard thing to prep for, but you kind of know the players and so that makes it not as hard as football. But when you're going kind of game in, game out, day in, day out with basketball, um, you, uh, you, you kind of um, – it's, it's some of it – like if I'm doing a Nets game, I've been following them all season, right? right. And, and I, and I kind of know 
what's going on with most NBA teams and whatever. And I feel like I'm able to stay up on the prep, you know, even in a uh, more, you know, e- even if it's not quite as, uh, as tuned in day to day as you are with baseball, right? I feel like you're still able to. With baseball, what's interesting is even though the games are every day, because you are with, you know, you're following the team every single day and whatever, it becomes kind of easier to prep day in, day out, because it, it, you're not like redoing things over and over again. Like for a new series and a new opponent, you are, right? But right. Then you're just kind of carrying things, almost as if you're doing a playoff series in basketball, where it's like you're not like prepping for a whole new opponent or two new teams. You're kind of like staying with the same teams, you know, and that makes it a little bit easier. And then you're kind of going in day in, day out, and you're figuring out, like, okay, what's relevant to this day? I'm going to go down to the clubhouse and get this story. I'm going to talk about this so I can bring this to the broadcast. But there's sort of, like, unique little wrinkles, but the big picture is sort of done for you once you get ready for a series. In basketball, you do feel like you're kind of creating a big picture over and over again with each game, which can make it challenging, mm-hmm. um, unless you're staying with the same teams. Um, and in football, it's always like a whole new big picture, but you have more time to do it. I don't know. That was a bit rambling. I don't know if that makes sense. But. <laughs> no, it totally made sense. Okay. Now, you do this podcast with CeCe Sabathia, uh, which is you've been doing for a while now. Now, how did you get started into that, and how did you even get CeCe to be on it with you? Well, CeCe was the one who actually came to me. So Really? Yes. So CeCe and I have had a, a good relationship for years. We've been uh, – first, we, you know, we were – we had a good relationship. We were friendly. Then we became friends. We had a lot of common friends. And I think that helped unite us. Um, And CC and I had always joked about like hosting a show together. He used to listen to my talk show on ESPN radio and he would text me during it. And he's just a diehard sports fan. He's always wanted to get into this and talk about sports, you know, beyond baseball even. And, um, and then he reached out to me in the spring of 2017. He's like, now's the time cuz let's start the (laughs) podcast. And I was like, I wonder if he he was still playing at the time, right? Yeah. And it was so smart of him to get started on it while he was playing, because obviously, you know, your input and uh, an opinion is never more valued than when you are a current athlete. Right. right? Yeah. And especially when you're one as respected and decorated as CC was and who had, was still having great success. You know, you look at his like 2017 is 2018. He still had terrific years um, and had his moments in 2019 as well when he was healthy. So he, it, it, it was the perfect timing to do it. And he said, he reached out and said, Hey, I want to do this. And I was like, look, if you're serious about it, I'm down, but like, here's the way we got to do it. And I never wanted to go back to the kind of talk show mentality of making mountains out of molehills mm-hmm. because that wore me down. It wasn't uh, sort of co-aligned with my psyche and general life philosophy. And I didn't want to do it. Um, and so I was like, um, if we want to do it, like be a storytelling and perspective and, and really getting to know guys, but no gotcha stuff. And he was like, cuz what do you think? I don't want to be criticizing these athletes. Like, I don't want to do that. Right. So we had a, like an hour long conversation. We were on the same page with what we wanted out of it. And then we said, okay, where can we go to it? Like, what's the right platform? And we both thought players tribune. Uh, he had a relationship with Derek Jeter, obviously, also, Sadie Zillow, who's uh, currently our coordinating producer, had worked there um, as a kind of independent contractor. So we facilitated it there and, uh, and then moved from there to Uninterrupted. And now we're about to make a big move as well. It's not quite announced yet. Um, mm. but, uh, but yeah, and it's just been great. And to CeCe's credit, unlike I think so many people who start on side ventures while they have a main thing going on and then they can't really follow through, CC has been able, he has fully invested the entire time. And when you do that, you know, you have a chance for consistency and success. And, and I, I give him a ton of credit because he's been all in on this project from the beginning. Now you talk about your personal relationship with CC. Um, and I'm just curious, like, what do you think is the line between covering someone like you did with CC during that time and also having a personal relationship with them? Because I know broadcasters are different than the typical fan where they see the players every day and, you know, more so than like a fan would. Yeah, man. I mean, I think it, uh, it can be a, it could be a tricky balance for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, it, depending on, you know, what kind of relationships you have and, and, uh, and where you're at, um, you know, with, uh, you know, with different people um, in, uh, you know, in the clubhouse or in a locker room or whatever. 
But my thing is, like, I always go by the Mike Breen rule. Like, he, you know, went to Fordham just like your father, just like me. You know, we, were, we had our WFEV workshops. And, like, Mike used to always say his rule is only say something on air that you'd say to someone's face. Mm. And, you know, I think that's where when you're doing a game and you're doing play-by-play, you're not looking for, like, salacious hits and adjectives, right? Like, I'm not – I don't need to say, like, oh, CC Sabathia is having an awful game, right? I can just say CC is struggling today. It's right. equally accurate and it's more fair, you know? And I think that has been kind of the, um, the philosophy I've tried to use. And CC knows, like, he's been on the mound when I'm calling a game and he gives up seven runs. I'm not going to be like, you know, CC, you know, he did his best today. He, he, he should have fared better, you know what I mean? No, I'm going to call it accurately. He knows. He's, he's, he'll text me, I suck today, man. You know, like, he'll right. joke like – you know, he'll joke about me being bad luck in the booth, but then he'll be like, yeah, I suck today. It wasn't you, man. But like, I, I think it's, I think the relationships, you know, sometimes we're taught it's sort of like a taboo to have, you know, these relationships with athletes and then cover them because how do you criticize them? But I disagree. I think when you, especially as a play-by-play guy, it's different as like a journalist, right? It's different if you're writing for the daily news or the New York post or sports illustrator, or whoever, um, but I think when you're doing play by play, especially like it is so beneficial to have good relationships, mm-hmm. you are going to get way more mileage out of having those good relationships than you are restriction from them, you know, or, or controversy. And I can tell you, I always feel comfortable saying on air what's actually happening on the field and what's actually going on. Now, if I'm doing a Yankees telecast, I'm not going to harp on the negative. But I wouldn't anyway, regardless of my relationships. I'm going to mention it factually, right? But I'm not going to, oh, Aaron Judge, what a slump he's been in. I mean, he just looks terrible at the plate right now. No, like, I don't really think that's – but am I going to say, hey, Aaron Judge still struggling. He's 0 for his last 16, trying to find his way out of it uh, and hasn't quite been able to break through. Here are some things he's working on. Yeah. And that's still accurate, but it's done in like sort of a kinder, uh, more considerate way and probably a way in which Aaron Judge is going to feel more comfortable than giving me things moving forward. But that doesn't compromise my journalistic integrity. Right. And so I think that's the balance. But I do believe when you have good relationships, like I'll give you an example. I have amazing relationships in that Yankees clubhouse, you know, and because of it during this period of time where we're not allowed in the clubhouse, but I'm still being asked to go on air and do things. Right. I can get on the phone with almost anybody in that clubhouse. You already know the players from, right, from previous and years. I, yeah, and I can get 10 minutes with them on the phone. I could just say, like, hey, Zach Britton, like, um, you know I can't be in there. I could use some stuff to go on air. Can we, ch- can we talk for five minutes today at some point at your convenience? And they're all, they all say yes, you know? And so it's like, okay, if I was like a little less close with them, like, maybe it, be, it becomes a little easier to, like, hammer them on air if you wanted to but that's not the goal anyway right and then i'd be robbed of all the good information i do get from them because they know i am going to treat it uh in the proper tenor and tone right like and i'm, I'm going to use it in a way that probably helps them look better because it's going to get like more positive information out or just more sort of perspective because athletes want the fans and the audience to hear their true perspective of things or why they're doing things they want that to get out. They don't just want you opining on why things are happening. Now, you've worked your way up the ranks, you know, pretty quickly. I mean, we talked earlier. I mean, you're only in your early 30s. Now, did you stress versatility growing up, or was it kind of just like, here's an opportunity, I'm just going to take it and go with it? Because I know you've done, you know, talk shows, play-by-play, the podcast. Yeah, like, I, I um, say that question one more time for me, Jack. Sorry. I was, I was just talking about that you've worked your way up the ranks really quickly. And did you stress, you know, being versatile more gotcha, gotcha. or was it, you yeah. know, more so taking so, an opportunity? I, I always wanted to do play by play, right? Like I knew that no matter what, but I sort of learned in my agent, my first agent, Jackie Harris helped me realize like, take whatever opportunity is there within the field of being on air. Right. It's like, you will crush it and more doors will open. So don't just like hold out for that perfect opportunity, like do something in the sphere of what you want to do. But like, you know, don't say no to it because you're waiting for, you know, just this one position. And so that was my mentality always. And like, look, I knew ultimately I didn't want to be a daily talk show host. Like I want to be a play by play person, but 
the opportunities that arose for me early were there, you know, and it made me a better play by play guy. Cause if you can vamp on air for that many hours, right. Alone or with a partner or whatever, it's going to help you be on air and play by play too. It's going to help, you know, introduce you to an audience. It's going to help develop relationships, different skills, all of that, right. All the skills do intersect in one way or another, you know, within this general field. So, um, and I do think it's more valuable now to be able to go to a network and say like, Hey, you can put me in the reporter role. You can put me as a studio host, you know, you can put me giving kind of like feedback on what happened in the game, or you can put me in play by play. And I feel like I'll be able to do all parts, you know, equally as, as uh, effectively, you know? And I think that for, you know, networks who want to be as efficient as possible with their personnel, there is value for that to be able to say, Hey, I can do any of these roles or I can do any of these sports, you know? Um, and my whole mentality was like, if you give me an opportunity, if you crack the door open for me, I will kick it down. And that was my, that was the image I used. And so whatever it was, it started with updates at ESPN radio, random updates. When I was, um, 21, I had, you know, just graduated college and I, I was doing updates, these really late shifts on ESPN radio once or twice a week. Then it turned into three days a week. You know, then it turned into filling in on more, you know, prestigious shifts, right? Then it turned into randomly fill in uh, uh, side kicking on shows. Then it turned into randomly fill in hosting. Then it turned into hosting my own show to 5 a.m. Then uh, with Robin Lumberg at 10 a.m. Then with Stephen A. Smith, you know, and it just kind of developed. Slowly working your way up, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and with play by play, yes, it was I was doing stats in the booth. Then they heard me at Fordham and they thought I was good. And they saw me doing stuff at the scoreboard for Yankee stadium hosting. And at yes, they said, Hey, we want to give you a couple games. They gave me Fordham games on. Yes. They liked those. And they said, Hey, we're going to give you one Nets game. They liked that. Then they say, Hey, we're going to give you five Nets games. They liked that. Then they said, Hey, we're going to make you the number two Nets announcer behind Ian cause Marv's leaving. Then, Hey, we want to integrate you into Yankees stuff on air. Hey, we like the studio. Now we want to have you do some Yankees play by play, you know, and like right. all that stuff, but saying yes, to all the opportunities allows the possibility of you getting to the ultimate opportunity. Thanks to Ryan Rucco for joining me on this week's edition of Jack in the Booth. You can hear Ryan on a variety of networks calling baseball and basketball games. You can also check out his podcast R2C2 with CC Sabathia. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Jack McShane.